For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, and to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you have delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little, and I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. And he also, who had two talents, came forward, saying, Master, master, you delivered me two talents, and here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little, and I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. He, who also received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what is my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will be given in abundance. But from the one who has not, even what has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where we'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Last week, we uh, dedicated children... Uh, This week, we're kind of launching out those children. Uh, Many of those have been dedicated at this church as a part of LifePoint and recognizing seniors. Next week, all men in here, next week is Mother's Day. (laughs) This is a little friendly discipleship here, okay? (laughs) Don't forget your mom. Men, if you're married and your wife has children, you remember her first. And then you go to your mom, all right? Uh, Some of you, so you you make sure you give her a gift and remember her and uh, thank the Lord for her. Uh, And then you can talk to me later about forgetting holidays, all right? (laughs) If you got your Bible, I hope you have them. You keep them open there to the book of Matthew 25. Uh, You know, we're going to be talking and continuing on today uh, in these parables. We've been reading and talking through the parables of Jesus, some of the parables of Jesus. Hopefully by now you remember what a parable is. It's an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning, a spiritual meaning. And uh, Jesus didn't always reveal all of what they meant. Uh, In fact, they were hidden from those who didn't know and revealed to those who had the Spirit of God. Uh, Some he explained very explicitly, some he did not. And today in this passage, one of the things that you're going to see, I think we're going to see, uh, we're going to be looking at it from different perspectives and seeing different angles and seeing some different things. And I'm hopeful that your perspective is going to be challenged. Uh, In the art world, we used to live in, in Europe. And I've, you know that, art full of art museums. When my wife has the opportunity for us to go to an art museum, we take it. And so we go and see artwork. And uh, I, I, I love the beauty of art. One of the things that I've learned, uh, I'm not an art expert, but one of the things I've learned is going to uh, art museums is that there is an era called perspectivism. And in perspectivism, it started around the Renaissance era. Uh, But prior to the Renaissance, everything was just flat, 2D. You would see a picture. It may be, I'm oversimplifying here. You need to know that. For those of you who are artists who are going to come, I'm oversimplifying here. But you might see an apple. You might see an orange. You could see a tree. But around uh, the Renaissance period with Da Vinci, with 
uh, Michelangelo with Rembrandt. They began an era of perspectivism where you began to see things in 3D, light, images, lines that provided depth. And in perspectivism, what the whole goal is, is to get your eye to, to a focal point, to get you to begin to see and see what is reality, to see what the artist wants you to begin to see. Some of you may have seen this even in some different artwork. Maybe, uh, maybe even you've seen this in Instagram lately. Have you ever seen those Instagram posts or social media posts where they're Someone, there's a sidewalk artist and people are walking down the sidewalk and it looks like you're about to walk into water or walk over into a, ho- into a hole and you, go, you see them stop. I'm not miming here or anything, but they stop and they're like tiptoeing around so that they don't fall into what appears to be a hole until somebody, they're standing there looking at it and somebody just walks across it. You see, it's, a, it, it, it's all about perspective and what it is that you're looking at and what it is that you're seeing. This is kind of what we're going to be seeing today in this parable. There are some perspectives that we're going to see, that we're going to understand, hopefully. And my hope is, is that your perspective is going to be changed. In Matthew 25, uh, this is a part of what's known as the Olivet Discourse. This is Jesus teaching on the Mount of Olives. He's about to be crucified. In fact, he tells his his disciples that in two days, I'm going to be uh, arrested. I'm going to then be crucified. I will die. So he begins to tell them these stories to help them to understand some things. And he doesn't even uh, unpack all of what these stories are all about. In Matthew 25, you see beginning in the, at the very beginning of the chapter there, he tells a story, uh, a parable about 10 virgins. And these 10, 10 virgins, his whole point here is that he wants us to be vigilant. He wants us to be vigilant. He wants you to be ready for his return. And then he moves to the parable of the talent. And in the parable of the talents that we've read today, and I want to say this, seniors in here, I can't think of a better passage for us to be looking at today for you as you're getting ready to launch out than the parable of the talents. But parents, don't turn off. Those of you who are here who don't have a child uh, who's launching out, don't you turn off either. Because in the parable of the talents, what he's trying to teach us is that we're to be diligent, vigilant with the parable of the, uh, of the 10 virgins, diligent, working hard until he returns. So he starts out this parable. He starts out this parable talking about a wealthy man, a wealthy man who goes on an extremely long journey. And, all, and, and he calls together his servants. He brings together three servants and he gives them a sum of money and This is called stewardship. He brings them there and he says, hey, I want to give you this and I want you to manage what it is that I've given you. He doesn't tell them when he's returning. There is an assumption that he's going to return, but he wants them to steward that. Now, you, maybe you've heard of a steward before. Maybe you've done some cruising on ships and you have a ship's steward who manages and helps to take care of the property so that you yourself, you have a good time. You hear the steward of the ship. Well, you also are involved in stewardship yourself because we've been given things that we are to manage. These three servants, to one, he gave five talents. To another, he gave two talents, it says. And to another, he gave a third talent. Look at verse 15. Look at verse 15 in this text. It's probably not going to be on the screen, but look on in verse 15, because this is a key phrase. In verse 15, he says, he gave to them each according to his own ability. Each to his own ability. That's a key phrase. If you're circling, writing down, that would be one to circle and write down. So he gave one five, he gave one two, he gave one one. Each to his own ability. Now, this word talent here is where we, in our language and in our idea, we get abilities and gifts. But that's not what this passage is talking about here. In, in this passage, the, a talent, it was a unit of measurement. It was a unit of money. In fact, it was the highest unit of money. Uh, you had the talent. You had a lot of others. We read oftentimes about Daenerys and uh, drachmas. These were like a daily wage. Well, a talent 
was used to measure gold and silver and bronze. A talent equaled about 75 pounds. Equaled about 75 pounds. It was very, very valuable. In this day and time, this would have represented somewhere around, for the one who got five talents, 100 years worth of salary. 100 years worth of salary. For the one who got two talents, this would have equaled somewhere around 40 years of salary. For the one who had one talent, it would have equaled one year of salary. You see, what's happening here, excuse me, I said one year, 20 years, 140 and 20. What's happening here is Jesus is telling a story of an exorbitant amount of wealth that these servants have been entrusted with. Let's take this for just a moment for uh, illustration's sake, for imaging's sake, and let's bring this to our own world today. Uh, in, in the value of gold, because this was used in gold and silver, it was used in bronze. Today, the average uh, cost of an ounce of gold is $1,800. A pound of gold would be $30,000. So if we were to bring this to us today, you thought you could think about it in the same terms of this manager has given you a hundred years worth of salary for you to manage. He's given some tw- uh, 40 years. He's given some 20 years worth of salary that he would desire them to manage. But think about it in gold. If in, the, in, in this respect, what you have is the one who got five talents, somewhere around $11 million in today's economy. He left for him to handle. The one with two talents, the one with two talents, it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of four and a half million dollars. For the one with one talent, it would be somewhere in the realm of $2.2 million. The master finally decides he's coming back. When he does come back, he doesn't announce when he's coming back. I hope that you're hearing some things here. He doesn't announce when it is that he's coming back, but... He comes back and he calls all of his stewards, all of his servants together. And the the one who had been given five talents, a hundred years worth of salary, $11 million. He says, listen, I've turned it into 22 million. Here you go. The one who had given two talents. Listen, the, 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 the 40 years. He says, listen, I've made it into 80. Listen, here's what I've really done. I've turned it into $9 million for you. Here. And do you know what, the, the, you know what the, 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 the master says? Look at verse 23. Verse 23, the master says to him, well done, or to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. But the third steward, the third servant comes And here's what he says. Here's what he says. Look with me here, if you will, in verse 24. In verse 24, he comes and he brings back and he says, listen, I knew you, master, I knew you to be a hard man. I knew that you were one you scatter and you reap in places that you didn't sow and it's not yours. This is what I knew of you to be. And because I didn't want you to lose anything, I took it and I went and buried it. So I'm bringing it back to you. Here it is. I'm bringing it back to you right now. I didn't lose any of it. I didn't lose any of it, but here it is. And notice what happens here. Notice what happens here. Rather than being happy, you know what the manager says? The manager says, he calls him wicked and lazy, a slothful. He says, you think I'm a hard man? If you thought, if you thought I was a hard man, you should have at least taken it to the bank, put it in the money market and got 2%. Listen, that, you could have done that. That's, I mean, that's what you could have done. He ordered then that that talent, look, in verse 29, In verse 29, look at verse 29. In verse 29, he says, Everyone who has, more will be given. And the one who has not, even what he has will be taken. He said, listen, take the one talent and give it to the one who had ten. And I want you to notice this. Not the one who had five, the one who had ten. You see, no longer was it just he had five talents. No, he he now recognizes he has ten. The one who had four now has eight He says, take it from the one and give it to the one with 10. And then here's the sobering part. 
Here's to the sobering part. I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm wanting you to catch this, and then we're going to break this down really quick. Here's the sobering part. The sobering part is, is that he then ordered that the wicked and lazy, slothful servant be cast out into the outer darkness, it says, to the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is a, this is a earthly story that has spiritual and heavenly meanings to it. Listen, here's what I can tell you. The writers were inspired by God. This is God's holy word. They used the language that we knew, what they knew, to communicate a truth. But I can tell you, weeping and gnashing of teeth, as bad as that sounds, the reality of that will be a thousand times worse than anything we could ever imagine. This is what, this is what he begins to say. So uh, why is it? I mean, literally, why is it that Jesus is teaching in parables? Well, one, he's teaching in parables because he wants to conceal, but he also wants to reveal. What is it that he is trying to reveal to us today? I think one of the things that he's trying to reveal to us today is what the secret of success really is. Students, seniors, Parents, I want you to clue in here. I, I, I want us to catch what is the real secret of success today because we're all striving for it. And here's the thing. We all have a perspective of what we think success really is. Uh, there's 160 people in here today, and there's probably 160 different definitions of what success looks like. It, we've bought Here's what happens. We have bought the perspective that success usually means a high-paying job, a great family, kids that do exactly what I want them to do. We're going to get to take a tropical vacation. We're going to have a nice little retirement account. The house is going to look this way. It's going to probably be this. It's going to set here, maybe in a cul-de-sac for some of you. Some of you are going, nope, I don't want a cul-de-sac. I want to be out in the woods. This is what, all of this stuff. We've got an idea. We have a perspective about what success truly is. Students in here, you seniors, the ones who are launching out, you're, you've got a definition of what success is going to look like. Some of you, you've bought that definition of success from your parents. It's been handed down to you. Today, I want you to catch a different perspective. Today, I want you to catch a different perspective. You see, because we often equate students, parents, Grandparents, we often equate success with how much we get, how much we gather. What does my, how many storage sheds and storage units I have? I mean, do we need another storage place in Rutherford County? Much like we need another mattress store in Rutherford County. If you own mattress stores, thank you, praise God. Be faithful with your talent. If you own storage sheds, be faithful with what it is he's given you. But obviously, we think success has something to do with what we gather, what we get. And Jesus comes, and he wants to give you a different perspective of what true success is. And here's what true success is, I believe, from this passage. True success is not determined by what you get, but what you do with what you get. It's not what you get it's what you do with what you get, what you are given, what you are granted. That's what true. Listen, true success can be defined in one word. You want to hear it? Okay, here it is. There's not a TED Talk on it. It's probably not going to be in your freshman history in English class. You're probably not going to get this in your trainings at work. Here is what true success is from the perspective of Christ. Faithfulness. It's faithfulness. Real success has to do with being faithful with what it is that he has given you. Whether you are a five-talent person, a two-talent person, or a one-talent person. Listen, it's easy in this day and age. We've seen on the news, we've seen on the sports channels. Listen, there are five-talent stars, aren't there? I mean, there's, there's, uh, you get drafted a certain way. Listen, there is supposedly a five-talent star at Nissan for the last three days. It, you, you realize that there's a lot of great two-stars and a lot of great athletes, two-star athletes and two-star uh, musicians, two-star artists, two-star developers, two-star, five-star lawyers, 
You know what the really bad thing, though, is, or the embarrassing thing is, is when you're a one-star and you want to be paid like a (laughs) five-star. You've been given something, several somethings in life. And you know what we've been called to be? Is faithful with what we've been given. So there's two things today that I want you to catch, and I'm going to talk about them really, really quickly. Number one is this, is that people, if you want to experience true success, And it revolves around faithfulness, the faithful labor. The faithful labor. I hope that you have seen and you heard. Some of you are going, well, you can give me the second thing. I will in a minute. Try to get you to hang in with me. I hope that you heard some similarities in this story. Because you you realize this story, I'm going to change your perspective, I hope, a little bit. This story isn't truly about a wealthy man. This truly is a story about a wealthy God. This story is about Jesus. This story is about Jesus who came to earth, who lived a perfect life, who was crucified on a cross, who rose again, and who went on a long journey. He ascended back to the Father. And he said, I'm going to return one day. This is true. He's telling this story in earthly terms so that we would begin to catch a spiritual heavenly story, that he, a reality, and he is trying to get our perspective. He wanted their perspective to be changed. And Jesus, when he left, he entrusted to us gifts, talents, abilities, talents exactly like is in the story. He entrusted you finances and money that he desires you to own and use. He entrusted you with homes and cars and children. You've been entrusted. I've been entrusted to steward what it is that he's given to us. And the real question is, is how are we doing that? Are we doing it? What is it that we're doing with what it is that's been entrusted to us? Most of the time, rather than utilizing well, how about, let me, let me back up. Let me talk about me uh, or use me as an example. Many times what I end up doing is I, I, rather than use, utilizing what it is that God's given me, I end up letting my gaze go to look at what someone else has. I become more enamored with what I don't have. Man, if I had that, oh man, I could. If I had that house, if I had that car, I could re- if I had that talent and that ability, I could really serve Jesus. I, I, me, I, you're probably like this also. You probably look at yourself as a two-talent person. Some of you may go, two-talent? I wish I was two. I'm one. Listen, in the eyes of someone else, you're probably a five-talent person. The question isn't, What are they doing with what it is that God's given them? The question is, is what are you doing with what it is that he's blessed you with? You realize you're not going to be held accountable for what they do. We're held accountable for what it is that's been entrusted to us. And what we have is we end up getting our perspective on someone else. We're looking at their story. When in reality, we need to be looking at our story. What is it that Christ has given us? What is it that he's called us to do? How is it that he desires me to labor? You see, listen, isn't it so easy to make judgments on someone else? Well, again, I'm probably speaking to me. (laughs) You probably don't deal with any of those things. (laughs) To look at, if I had what, they're wasting it. When in reality, the question is, is what am I doing with what it is that God has given me? What is it that he's called me to do? What is it that he desires for me to be involved in? You realize that you're in the scripture, the Bible has kind of a dual perspective on possessions. The scripture, it's, it's, it's really a both and. Listen, the Lord and you both own possessions that you have. He gives you abilities. He's given you talent. He's given you a job that you go and you labor faithfully at that job. You are there. You're there. You earn money, and then you're able to buy these possessions. But we also know that James 1.7 says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. 
So what, he, what you have, yes, is yours, but it has come from the hand of God that he has given it to you to steward. Students, you've got intellect, you've got opportunity, you get to go and do, try to uh, gain knowledge. The question is, is what is it that you're going to do with it? Parents, you've been given homes, you've been given cars, you've been given jobs, you've been given a mind, you've been given time. The question is, is how are you faithfully laboring? What is it that you're doing? Because again, I want to make sure that you hear me. We're not held accountable for what someone else does with the gifts they've been given. We're held accountable for the, what we have done with what it is that God has given to us and how it is that he's called us to be involved in laboring. And we all want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. This is what he said uh, uh, the, to the two, the one with five and the one with two. He said, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Isn't there something about hearing someone that you love, maybe a mom and a dad, maybe an aunt and uncle, maybe there is a significant person in your life and you love it when you hear from them. I'm proud of you. Well done. You've done an awesome job. Some of you today, you're stuck at an error because you didn't hear that from the people you truly desired to hear that from. I need you to know, I want you to hear this. Write it down. You serve, if you follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you submitted your life to him, we have the greatest opportunity one day we're going to hear from him, well done, thy good and faithful servant. The question is, is are we faithfully laboring with what it is that he's given us? True success is recognizing that what I have comes from the hand of God, and he has given it to me, to you, to your family, so that you will fa be faithful with it, faithfully laboring, faithfully utilizing what it is that he's given you, faithfully laboring so that he is the one who gains the glory from all of this. This is what it is that he's called you to. Uh, uh, for some, I'm, this may be a bad illustration. You ever driven down the road and you're, you see, no matter where you are, you'll see a big billboard that if you buy this ticket, you have a chance to win how many millions of dollars? And you play that game with your family. Hey, what if we won that? What would we do with it? And always when you're playing with someone else's money, you know what, it's easy. I mean, you, you've got it spent. You, and you're doing all kinds of great philanthropy. You're giving not 10%, 20% to the church on that. You're going to orphanages, you're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and you're going to do this. And let, let me tell you something. If we're not doing it with what it is the Lord has entrusted to us today, we won't do it with that. You see, we have to be faithful with what it is, diligent diligent to work the field that he's given us. The faithful, they labor. The second thing really quick is this. The faithful are rewarded. The, the faithful labor and the faithful are re rewarded. Notice that when the master returns, he had three rewards for them. The first one is this. The first one is, is he commended them. Well done. Well done. Well done. The second thing that he tells them, he says, hey, enter into your master's joy. Come on in. Come on in. Well done. Come into my home. Come into the place that I've designed. And the third thing is this. He says, you're going to be put in charge of more. Because you faithfully labored, now then you're going to be rewarded with more. This is what the scripture teaches. This is what he says. He says, you were faithful while I was gone with the little bit that I gave you. Now then, I'm going to be faithful to give you more. Well done. Come in, and there's more. One day, Jesus is going to return. I need, I, 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 if you don't hear anything else, I need you to stop and hear this. One day, Jesus is going to return. Students, I need you to hear. Try to make contact with all these students. I want you to hear. One day, Jesus is returning. He's going to come back. And the question is, is are we going to be faith, found faithful, laboring, with what it is, because he's going to reward us in that. He's going to say, well done. He has 
a judgment coming for us. And those of us who are in Christ, if you're in Christ Jesus, you, there's been a point where you've surrendered your life to Jesus. I need you to hear this. If, if there has been that point in your life, you will not stand before him in judgment for your eternity. That's been sealed, done. Your pardon has come, not because of any work you do, but because of the work he does. Some of you are going, okay, you got to help me with this work. Hang on to that question because I'm going to answer it. But I promise you this, we're also going to stand in a judgment that judges what it is that we faith, have we faithfully labored. The scripture talks about in Corinthians, it says that all our work will be judged one day and it will go through the fire and it will be tested either wood, hay or stubble or gold and precious stones. Now, here's the great thing. It doesn't matter with any of us how you may get a huge pile and I'm going to get a itty bitty 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 pile. The scripture says that we're going to take our piles, however big or large, and we're going to throw them at his feet and say, this is all for you, Jesus. It's all for you. Because the true joy, the true reward is being with him. Not so for those who are faithless. Not so for those who are faithless. The scripture is very clear, is that they will be cast out. Cast out to darkness. This is what the scripture teaches us. This is what the scripture teaches us. It, it's a tough teaching. Listen, and that doesn't mean that the faithless don't work hard. The, the five-talent athlete, the five-talent artist, the five-talent musician, they all work hard or they wouldn't be the goats of the day, would they? They work hard. The problem is for them, it is this, is that it was for their glory, not his name. It was for their glory, not his name. You see, the faithful labor hard for the glory of God. They take what it is that has been given to them, their, their finances, their money, their time, their everything goes for the glory of the Lord. It is for him and him first. So here's the obvious question. Here's the obvious question. Really, let's make it two questions. Have you thought about what you've been given? Your time, your talents, your abilities, your possessions. If I right now ask you to make an inventory of the things that you can think, man, the Lord has given me this. He's given me this. Man, it, I've got a house. It's hard for me to serve him in my house because, man, it's, it doesn't feel like it's large enough. I can't. I, I need you to hear me. You serve him with what you have. Man, I wish if I had more money. Oh, my word. If I had more money, I would... He's giving you money. I don't, know which, I don't know what size bank account. I don't know how small. I don't, listen, you may go, I don't even have a bank account. I don't trust banks. <laughs> well, let me, here's a question. Are you using your finances for him? Uh, do you get the first cut or does he get the first cut? Are you worried about faithfully giving to someone in need? Because you, you feel like your needs are much more than theirs. Listen, we follow a God, we follow a God, I need to hear it, that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He, he didn't even have a, his own testimony is, is that he came into his own and his own received him not. He, he said the son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. Homes, cars, riches, fame, one day it will all fade away. And we're going to stand and Will we be found faithful in our labors of what he's given us? Will we be the ones with reward? Some of you have great, great abilities. You love technology. You love serving kids. Some of you love to stand up and talk. Some of you love to draw. Some of you are great cleaners. Some of you are great bakers and candlestick makers. <laughs> Do you realize the Lord has given you that gift and he's desiring you to steward it for his glory? And I, need, I want you to hear me. There's a place for you in this body. Uh, this body needs you to exercise the gift that he's given you. If you like to play the bass... 
we got a place for you to play the bass. You like to pull knobs and switches and something on a computer, I got a place for you. You like handing out crackers and cookies? Austin has a place for you. (laughs) If you love people, we've got a thousand places for you. Students, you've been entrusted with something, multiple somethings. Let's... Let's go to the one talent person. I need you to hear me. This one talent person has proved that he wasn't a follower of Christ to begin with. He wasn't a follower of Christ to begin with. You see, James, look look at James. Turn over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 17 tells us, and I want you to be able to see it very clearly. It tells us this, that faith without works is dead, null and void. If we do not work for our salvation, the reason that we work is because we've been given salvation. And if you say, I follow Jesus, but your life never exhibits that, the question is, is is he truly changed your life? The person who is go, 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 go has to really examine, am I trusting in my works or am I trusting in the fact that Christ has changed me? You see, these go together. Students today, parents today, this parable is meant to change our perspective. It's to focus us to draw our attention in on Christ himself. The one who came, the one who served, the the master who has gone away on a long journey, but I can guarantee you he is coming again because he has told us this. And when he comes, he is bringing recompense in his hands, he says. And he's going to reward us. Those who have been found faithfully laboring, Those who have said, I have trusted in him. He is mine. I follow him and him alone. And what I do, I do for his glory alone. Oftentimes, believers, we we think that what Jesus calls us to is a great sacrifice. And I those of you who have walked this path for a long time, you recognize that when you obey, that obedience becomes your joy, not sacrifice. You know why? Because Jesus is your great treasure. You you know what I'm so thankful for? Is that I can't labor enough. Jesus has labored for me, so therefore I get to serve. The reason I get to serve is because his work, his finished work was on the cross. Today, The scripture tells us in Hebrews that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Being seated represents finished, complete work. It's done. It's over. We we can't work enough. But we can serve the master with what it is that he's given you, what he's given you, what he's given you. I look around here, there are so many five-talent people in here. It's time to multiply your efforts. There's so many two-talent people in here. It's time to multiply our effort. There's so many one-talent people of which I'm one of. It's time to multiply our efforts because the scripture tells us when we're faithful with little, he'll put us in charge of more. And the great thing is is that we don't always recognize, we, we don't see that. We're just serving. You're just serving. You're just doing. And when I come and ask you about doing something, me, I I can't do that. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, the reason you're being asked is because you're already involved. You're following him. You're serving him. Go. Jesus loves you, and what the enemy is speaking to you is lies. Lies. You can do exactly what it is that he's called you to do. The talent he's given you, we Want that released in this body. For the glory of God.
for the good of his church. Will you faithfully labor with us so that one day we see the reward? You know what the reward for us today is seeing other people come to know Christ. And that's what we invite you to today. Today I invite you, would you surrender your life to Jesus Christ? The one, the one, the true, the true lover of your soul. Father, I love you and I thank you for today. I thank you for the privilege that you give us to be called your servant, to be stewarding the gifts that you've given us. Gifts of ability, gifts of talent, gifts of possession. We acknowledge that it all comes from you and you've entrusted it to us. So they're ours and we're now responsible And Father, I am so thankful. I'm so thankful that you're the one who gets the glory for the increase, of whatever that looks like. Father, I'm thankful that you are the one who gives increase, that we couldn't even serve rightly if it wasn't for your spirit living within us. Jesus, we magnify you. I pray blessing upon these students and their families. Father, I'm asking that today your Holy Spirit would save people. Men, women, I'm asking that today, God, you would give them courage to respond. Lord, we acknowledge you're the one who saves, but you've called us to respond. You're the author of salvation. And now then, Father, would you let people respond in faith? Jesus, we magnify you today. And it's in the name of Jesus that we ask these things today. Amen.